Today, we're going to look at the elephant in the room, that is, the huge fountain which is at the source of not only type 2 diabetes, but also heart disease, high blood pressure, and a host of other physical afflictions. And I'm talking about insulin resistance. Today, we're going to take a look at some of the insights shared by Benjamin Bickman in his new book, How We Get Sick. Now, Bickman is not a doctor, at least he's not a medical doctor. He is a scientist and does have a PhD in the field of bioenergetics, and he's a professor on the subject of pathophysiology. Now, that's quite a mouthful, and uh, I can imagine him being asked, what does he do? And he says, well, I teach pathophysiology, <laughs> something I had not heard until I read this dust jacket. Anyway, Bickman is a bit of a research nerd, which you'd have to be to write a book like he did. It's filled with studies and statistics, but he speaks enough real English for most people to get the heart of what he's saying. And the heart of that is that insulin and insulin resistance is a problem. Author Rob Wolf writes this about the book Why We Get Sick. Heart disease, diabetes, neurodegeneration such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are all increasing. We know more about these diseases than ever before, yet we seem virtually powerless to do anything about them. But what if, instead of all these conditions and diseases being separate and disconnected, one physiological state, elevated insulin levels, was the driver of all this suffering? And that is precisely the case that Benjamin Bickman is making in this book. Today, we'll look at some of the things he has to say and consider whether high insulin levels may just be the elephant in the room of many of the major and ubiquitous diseases of our day. Writing the foreword for the book is none other than Dr. Jason Fung, who relates how he and Bickman have come to the same conclusions through differing methods. Fung writes, What I was seeing clinically, Ben was studying scientifically in his lab and I was immediately impressed with how he explained many of the metabolic benefits I was seeing in my patients. So Dr. Fung was observing this on a more practical level, seeing his patients reverse their diabetes through low-carb eating and intermittent fasting, and concluding that as insulin resistance is dealt with, glucose levels are normalized and diabetic complications are either eliminated or significantly reduced. And Benjamin Bickman, meanwhile, was finding out the exact same thing as he researched and followed study after study that all pointed to insulin resistance as suspiciously present in all kinds of diseases and physical maladies. Bickman tells how as he researched to teach his university students about diseases of modern civilization, insulin resistance and very high insulin levels kept showing up again and again. He writes, I was dumbfounded when I found insulin resistance directly caused high blood pressure, high cholesterol, arterial plaques, and more. The link was more than tangential. He goes on to say, I began trying to find any evidence of insulin resistance in other diseases, and I learned that it was present in almost every chronic disease. Benjamin Bickman began to realize he had found not the fountain of youth, but the fountain of disease and misery. Insulin resistance was nearly omnipresent when you investigated cases of heart disease, when you looked at patients with high blood pressure, with diabetes, and with a host of other diseases. Now, Bickman is not an old man. He did not discover this after decades of study. He found this fairly quickly while still relatively young simply by following the science, the research, the studies, and trials related to metabolic disease and insulin resistance. One of the things he relates is that insulin resistance used to be considered an affliction of the old and rich people who eat too well. But today, the poorer nations have surpassed the wealthier nations in insulin resistance. You can find it all over the place, in Africa, in India, and nearly everywhere else and the majority of people who have it don't even know they have it. 
Insulin resistance occurs long before glucose levels reach diabetic levels and can cause all sorts of mischief and physical problems before you were ever diagnosed as diabetic. Now, before we go any further, we need to consider exactly what insulin resistance is. Here is Bickman's own definition of it. At its simplest, insulin resistance is a reduced response to the hormone insulin. When a cell stops responding to insulin, it becomes insulin resistant. Ultimately, as more and more cells of the body become insulin resistant, the body is considered insulin resistant. Certain cells need more than normal amounts of insulin to get the same response as before. Thus, the key feature of insulin resistance is that blood levels of insulin are higher than they used to be, and the insulin often doesn't work as well. Insulin is the hormone released by our pancreas to escort our blood sugar into our cells and to keep our blood sugar levels humming along normally. In a normal situation, we should have blood glucose somewhere between 75 and 90 before meals and maybe up to 120 or 130 after meals. As soon as we start crossing over the 100 boundary as a fasting glucose, doctors will often caution us to take it easy. And if we begin to have fasting glucose at 126 milligrams per deciliter or an A1C of 6.5 or higher, they will tell us we are diabetic. But before our glucose rises that high, often our bodies are requiring more and more and more insulin to keep our glucose levels normal. And your body desperately wants to do that. That is why your pancreas will release floods of insulin to make that happen. In a way, it's like inflation. I can remember in the late 1970s here in the U.S., we had terrible inflation. Interest rates for home loans were running in the double digits. Prices of food and other items were increasing rapidly from year to year. It took far more money to buy a pound of hamburger than it took the year before. Salaries were going up, but so were prices. Insulin resistance is a sort of metabolic inflation. It takes more and more insulin to do the same job in keeping your blood sugar low. As a result, even though your glucose levels may be almost normal, and your A1C may be in the fives or low sixes, you may be going around every day with insulin levels two times, three times, or even as much as ten times the normal levels. And this state of extremely elevated insulin is called hyperinsulinemia. And Bickman insists in his book that this insulin-saturated state is suspiciously present in people with high blood pressure, Alzheimer's, often cancer, heart disease, and many other afflictions. It is truly the elephant in the room that appears to be causing much of the physical havoc in human beings today. Bickman declares that it is elevated insulin, not glucose levels, that should be a huge warning bell that disaster is ahead. According to him, if you have high glucose levels, almost certainly you will have had high insulin for years beforehand, working behind the scenes, invisible and unnoticed, creating all sorts of miseries, making your blood pressure rise, causing you to get infections easily, and often giving you heart problems and hardening of your arteries, and sometimes laying the foundation for cancer, are in your later life Alzheimer's. Bickman writes this, Glucose is the typical blood marker we use to diagnose and monitor diabetes, but we should really be paying attention to insulin levels first. It's not that high glucose is not incredibly damaging to our bodies. It is. It's just that high insulin levels are the road sign that says, warning, danger ahead. And that danger will not only include diabetes, but many other diseases as well. Cut off the elevated insulin and you stop diabetes in its tracks even before you're ever diagnosed as diabetic. Bickman writes, Type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance that has progressed to the point where the body is unable to keep blood glucose levels below the clinically relevant 126 mg per deciliter. Ben believes that insulin resistance is the major contributor to high blood pressure. In his mind, if you have high blood pressure, you have insulin resistance. He writes, There is no debate. Insulin resistance and high blood pressure are related. 
However, what is news is that they're not just related. We're coming to understand that insulin resistance and high insulin levels directly cause high blood pressure. In the old days, the main culprit that took the blame for high blood pressure was salt. If you had high blood pressure, you'd be told to cut that salt. No more putting salt on your food. And maybe while you're at it, cut out all the caffeine from your life. No more coffee, no more tea, no more salt. But a new paradigm has risen that says, quit worrying so much about salt and coffee and start worrying about donuts, lasagna, and mashed potatoes. For the higher your insulin levels go, the higher your blood pressure will rise. Now, the good news about this is that typically when you find a way to reduce your insulin levels and the carbohydrates in your diet, your blood pressure will follow along meekly like a little lamb and will lower on its own along with your glucose levels without any fanfare. And I can confirm that this is surely true from all the reports I've received from former diabetics who found out that as they changed their diets and reduced their glucose spikes, thus reducing their insulin levels, their blood pressure magically dropped down into normal levels, something they weren't even thinking about or expecting. And when it comes to heart disease and atherosclerosis, Bickman insists the same is true. He writes, Though we often blame other factors, there is no single variable more relevant to heart disease than insulin resistance. Any successful efforts to reduce our high risk of heart disease must address it. Instead of simply allowing your heart problems to get worse and worse and hoping to fix it later with stents, various procedures, or heart bypass operations, Pickman says do something about it before it ever gets to that point by adopting the kind of lifestyle that drops those insulin levels from extremely elevated back down into a normal range. He writes, The longer we overlook insulin resistance, the worse the problem will get. Some circles acknowledge it as a piece of the puzzle, but the truth is more dramatic. It is the puzzle. Insulin resistance and cardiovascular disorders are almost inseparable. Where you find one, you find the other. When it comes to cancer, Bickman quotes the work of German physician Heinrich Warburg, who discovered long ago that cancer cells have an almost total reliance on glucose as their primary metabolic fuel. So any diet high in carbs and sugars is going to provide the optimum environment for cancers to grow. Now, this doesn't mean you eat a piece of cake and you get cancer, of course, but it does indicate that any diet which provokes high insulin makes cancer more likely than if that same person ate a diet that does not provoke high levels of insulin. According to studies, people with hyperinsulinemia have twice the likelihood of dying from cancer, and women with the highest insulin levels are those who have the worst breast cancer outcomes. Bickman's book is divided into three sections the problem of insulin resistance, the cause of insulin resistance, and the solution to insulin resistance. Now, until now, we've been looking at section one, the problem of insulin resistance. Let's now consider the cause or causes. If we end just with part one, we'd all be depressed. If insulin resistance is really that evil and causes that much trouble for us and there was nothing we could do about it, well, that would just be horrible. So we have to understand what causes us to become insulin resistant. Why are some people greatly insulin resistant, others mildly insulin resistant, and some don't seem to have this problem at all? Well, the cause of insulin resistance, according to Benjamin Bickman, is exactly the same cause that Dr. Jason Fung has been declaring for years. Bickman says that too much insulin floating around in our bloodstream causes insulin resistance. What he suggests is a vicious cycle. The more your diet provokes a strong insulin response, the more insulin you'll have in your blood. And as your body becomes conditioned to outrageously high levels of insulin, it will become even more insulin resistant. More insulin, more resistance. More resistance, more insulin. And round and round it goes until finally your doctor tells you you are diabetic with an A1C far above the normal limits or that you have high blood pressure, or that you need heart surgery. Now, if this is true, and I'm convinced it is, any way or any means, any method, any lifestyle, any change that you can make 
Any diet you can adopt that will lower your glucose levels and consequently lower the insulin response from your pancreas will help you in far more ways than you can imagine. And that simple logic means that what I've been preaching about for the last 15 years through my books and through this YouTube channel for the last several years, the idea of a low-spike, low-sugar, low-carb diet plus time-restricted eating is the perfect approach to a life of health, metabolic fitness, and can solve a host of other physical issues. When you keep your spikes low, your pancreas will not spew out tons of insulin. There'll be no need for that. Here's a newsflash. Your pancreas is smart. It knows that when you stuff down a huge piece of German chocolate cake, it must release some serious insulin to deal with all that glucose. Now, when you eat a Cobb salad, yeah, there's still a need for insulin, but not nearly so much insulin. So instead of dumping out a huge ton of insulin, as with the cake, instead your pancreas will release a slow trickle of insulin. And when you make low-carb eating your normal practice, day in and day out, you go through your days with smaller and smaller insulin levels, and as a result, you grow more insulin-sensitive rather than insulin resistant. And when you add time-restricted eating and maybe a little extra fasting, it's even all the more powerful. Now, I know that's simple, but it is very, very powerful. The book is called Why We Get Sick by Benjamin Bickman, and it espouses a powerful insight, one with which I totally agree. Some of Bickman's language and concepts are a bit complicated. It's not the easiest read, but it's worth slowing down and thoroughly assimilating the truths that he declares. Now, I'm not so naive as to suggest that insulin resistance is behind every sickness and every physical affliction that people ever have. Nor would I suggest that if you just eat low carb, you're guaranteed to never get sick, never get the flu, never be sick in any way, and live to be 120 before you die peacefully in your sleep. <laughs> Life is more complicated than that. But I do agree that high insulin levels are a major, let me repeat that, a major fountain of sickness and disease in our world today. And as I have said so often, our world is overdosing on carbohydrates, and insulin resistance is the price we pay. The good news is, if you'll change your lifestyle, you will change your prospects. Okay, that's it for now. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up so YouTube will recognize its value and promote it to other diabetics that are seeking answers. And consider subscribing to this channel and then click that bell icon so you'll be notified every time we post a new video. God bless and see you again soon.